it's unethical medical practice which is the norm and you have to very often search for an ethical medical practitioner not all doctors are corrupt but you have to hunt for the doctor who is not corrupt who is not unethical and whose primary goal is not to make millions in the shortest possible time and own a Rolls Royce, Mercedes Benz, six flats in six different metropolitan cities in India and so on and so forth. This is a sad commentary but that is how it is. So philosophy, humanities, history, ethics, all these are <coughs> of relatively little importance or of negative importance. There are some exceptions, but as you will see, over a hundred and something medical colleges that we have, I can list more than three of them for this purpose. There are very obvious reasons for including the humanities in the medical curriculum. And to all of you over here, these reasons are self-evident. There is no question that inclusion of these subjects will enrich the lives of the students and as they become practitioners will make them more responsive to the needs of patients and make them better doctors. There's no question of that. <clears throat> Humanities also help in other ways. They help the doctor to try and cope better with individuals. The competition doesn't ease after they join medical college because then they have to compete if they want house posts and if they want to become registrars and if they want to become consultants. So the competition continues. And we now have tuitions, postgraduate tuitions in medicine, surgery, obstetric gynecology. And the competition is horrendous. It's absolutely terrible. And I'm very grateful that I don't have to compete. And I joined medical college at a time when life was so much easier. I never had to face these problems. But the children who want to join medical college today have a very, very, very rough time. There is also no aptitude test to assess integrity and empathy. We have to design it, including all these aspects, which are totally foreign to medical education as it exists today. As far as the examinations are concerned, the examinations in the medical college for the degrees, undergraduate, postgraduate, these are totally devoid of any assessment of the humanities, of ethical practice, of humane approaches to patients. We don't look, when we are conducting these exams, how does that particular candidate approach the patient? How does he walk towards the patient's bed? How does he talk to the patient? Does he care at all for the relatives who are hovering around the bed of the patient, anxious and tense? Does he talk in a condescending manner? Or does he try and elicit a good history in a very sympathetic manner? How does he examine the patient? Is it a 50-second hurried examination? Or does he conduct a slow, painstaking, detailed examination? Nobody bothers to attend to these factors when they are assessing the proficiency of the candidate. We also have problems with our faculty. Having been a member of the teaching faculty for many years, again, I'm sorry to have to state that this is a fact, that many, many members of the teaching faculty of many, many medical colleges in Bombay are at a total loss if you talk to them about history, literature, art, music, dancing. 
few of them show genuine interest in the welfare of the patient. And the points that Dr. Ranjana Srivastava was covering are totally foreign to their ways of thinking. In many, many instances, all thoughts are focused only on one point and sharply focused at that. How do I extract the maximum amount of money from this patient and this patient's family? This is the tragic but sad situation now. Dr. Satrinder talked about behavior and speech. They will talk about ethics. They will tell their students that it's important for us to be ethical, to be sympathetic, to be humane. But when the students watch them during their ward rounds, they will find that when the patient is poor, when the patient is illiterate, the patient is treated with no sympathy whatsoever, with no respect whatsoever. At the same time, if there be a rich or politically powerful patient, then there will be a lot of fawning, virtually crawling in front of the patient. So when the student sees this kind of behavior, whatever he has been told about ethics and ethical practices flies out of the window. And it is but natural, because this is what they see their teachers practicing. So what you say counts for nothing. It's what you do. And these students are very intelligent. These young students who have fought so much of competition to enter medical college are extremely intelligent. You can't fool them. What we need is what is encapsulated in that last sentence over there. We need means by which we create eternal flames of the humanities in the minds of our students. And this is sadly lacking. There are other aspects which we need to consider. This is a representative example of a bed in an Indian <coughs> intensive care setup. You will notice that it's surrounded by cement and concrete and is full of machines. There are no windows, there are no trees, there are no flowers. Our inpatients are denied the healing power of nature. They don't see trees, they don't see flowers, they don't see color, they don't listen to birds, they can't see or hear any streams, and they're sealed off interiors with the beep, beep, beep of machines going on all the time and hectic <coughs> activity as serious patients are wheeled in or somebody is taken out for a test or whatever, is not conducive to the welfare or the well-being of the patient. We need to restore nature to patients in the intensive care unit. Why do we have meetings like this in India, given these dismal circumstances? It's because we still have hopes and we still have dreams. What are the hopes that we have? We hope that someday learning and practicing medicine will be a joyous and an intellectually rewarding experience instead of the money-grabbing exercise that goes for medical practice today. We hope that we can widen the horizons of all our doctors well beyond the limits which are imposed by medicine and science in general. We hope someday that they will be creative in a variety of fields of their choice. We need research projects which will improve our knowledge of our heritage in medicine in particular and the sciences in general. We need workshops like this, but not preaching to the converted as we are now. We need people who are totally disinterested in the subject to be exposed to this kind of talk and this kind of thinking and to these kinds of experts. These are our dreams. We hope that someday there will be 
sustained productive departments of the humanities. Why do I say sustained? We have had departments of the history of medicine. We've even had an institute of the history of medicine in Hyderabad. Once the founder passed away, by the time the second and third generation took over, many of these departments closed down because there was no interest in the subject. The Institute of the History of Medicine, which was founded in Hyderabad at the Osmania Medical College, was a broad-based department of the history of medicine. That department was respected by the likes of Charles Singer and Henry Segrist. Today, you have to ask, where is this Institute of the History of Medicine when you go to the Osmania Medical College? And if you do enter it, you will find that its contents are restricted only to Yunani and Ayurvedic medicine. Modern medicine has been given short shrift. The books which the founder, Dr. D. V. Subareddy, had collected are still there, but they are collecting dust. Hardly anybody opens and reads them. So we need all these things. We need someday, we hope, that libraries and museums will flourish, where all these subjects that have been listed here will be studied with joy, which will be studied with interest. And that someday we will see streams of essays, books, works of art by students and staff from our institutions. We hope that someday the manner in which medicine is practiced in this country will change. That there will be honesty, empathy, generosity of spirit as intrinsic parts of the physician. That will be his natural behavior. We hope that there will be genuine concern for the welfare of patients. And we hope that the definition of a professional, which Judge Tuttle enunciated in America many decades ago, will become the norm for medical professionals in India. What is it that Judge, Profe Judge Tuttle said? These are his words. The professional is a man who provides service. I will, read, I will leave you to read the other two paragraphs. I hope that someday this message will be engraved on the minds and souls of all our medical practitioners. These are not isolated sentiments. Sir William Osler had uttered very similar sentences, sentiments. And you heard today Francis Peabody being quoted. Very similar sentiments. These are universal sentiments. It's just that we need to take them to heart. Have we had medical professionals in India at all? There have been. And I've chosen two examples out of several that we have had in the past. The lady on your left, Dr. Watsala Samant, was a medical student at the St. G.S. Medical College and K.E.M. Hospital in Bombay in the 1930s, around 30, 35 or so. At that time, the dean of the institution was a gentleman named Dr. Jivraj Mehta. Dr. Jivraj Mehta was a physician who later became a politician, he became the chief minister of Gujarat, he was the Indian High Commissioner in London, and so on. And he was also the personal physician to Mahatma Gandhi, Jivraj Mehta. Outstanding physician, outstanding disciplinarian. He made the St. G.S. Medical College and K.E.M. Hospital what they are today. In a very recent survey, it has been stated that all medical students today, the first preference in the state of Maharashtra, the first preference when they are asked, which college do you want to join? It is Jivraj Mehta's college, Sage G.S. Medical College, that they want to join. So he 
it was who set this college on the path by which it has risen to this position. Vatsala Samant was his student. She decided on a career in obstetrics and gynecology. And she had just graduated and was now looking forward to entering practice in Bombay. When Jivraj Mehta called her to his office, he was the dean. And he told her, I've just received a telephone call from Jawaharlal Nehru in Delhi. Jawaharlal Nehru was the prime minister. Jawaharlal ne they were on first name terms. So Jawar has told me that he needs an obstetrician and gynecologist in Allahabad, which was Jawaharlal Nehru's hometown, because they have no obstetrician, obstetrician no gynecologist. And I have chosen you to go there. Allahabad was a strange place for Vatsala Saman. She never knew what Allahabad was. She never visited. She didn't know anything. She was a Maharashtrian from the state of Maharashtra, at that time Bombay presidency. But since her teacher and her dean was telling her that he wanted her to go there, she went. And she set up the Kamla Nehru Hospital in Allahabad which today has a great reputation in and around Allahabad and indeed in northern India. So she did this, and this is a photograph which was taken about a year before she died. She eventually settled in Pune, where she lived with her daughter, and she died over there. So disregarding the call for fame and fortune in Bombay, Obeying the dictate of her teacher and her dean, she went to Allahabad and set up this institution. And because she was a very competent and a very good obstetrician and gynecologist, she rapidly brought it to national repute. Let me tell you a story about this gentleman on the right. He was a consultant physician in the hospital in which I trained which was the JJ Hospital in Bombay, attached to the Grand Medical College. Very eminent, in his days, he was the consultant's consultant in the city of Bombay for medical illnesses. That was the level of his expertise, and that was his reputation. When senior consultants had difficult problems, they would approach him and ask him for his opinion and advice. One day, he was sitting in his consulting room, seeing a patient when he got a telephone call from a general practitioner. Sir, I would like you to come and see a patient. So he told this general practitioner, who was his student, past student, he said, look, is it urgent? So he's saying, yes, sir, the patient is very ill. In that case, would you mind calling somebody else? Because my appointment book is chock-a-block full, and I really have no time to see the patient. I'll give you the names of two doctors whom I trust and in whom I have faith. Call them up. One of them will come and see the patient. So that doctor took down the names and telephone numbers, and Dr. Modi put the phone down and started re-examining his patient. Ten minutes later, he gets another telephone call from the same doctor. Sir, both of them say that they are extremely busy and they cannot come to see the patient. So I'm surprised that they should say so. Where is the patient? Sir, the patient is living in this chawl. A chawl is a tenement where the poorest of the poor in Bombay live. And this man was a mill worker who was out of job and who was extremely poor and desperately ill. No wonder the other two physicians were too busy and could not go and see the patient. So Dr. Menorchar Modi told him, why didn't you tell me this before, that this patient is poor and this patient lives in a chawl? All right, let me see. It's now about 12.15. At 1 o'clock, I have my lunch break. You come to my office at 1 o'clock and pick me up. I will come with you. I will see this patient. And it doesn't matter if I don't have lunch on one day. So he went with the doctor, went to the chawl, examined the patient. And his examination was a minimum of 30 minutes, because he had to take a history, and then he had to examine the patient, and then he had to 
So it was a usual, painstaking, careful examination of the patient. Then he talked about the diagnosis. He prescribed whatever he felt should be done. And just before leaving, he went to the head of the patient's bed and did something underneath his pillow. And then he walked out with the general practitioner. <clears throat> so the general practitioner said, sir, what did you do under the pillow? Oh, I just slipped a few currency notes because he will need something to buy the drugs which I have prescribed. So these were the medical professionals of the past. And it has been my good fortune to have Dr. Minochar Modi as one of my exemplars in Bombay. This is what we need to return to in India. And unfortunately, at the moment, I do not see signs of a general return throughout the country to this state of medical practice. Thank you.